I, uh, I want to just make a special thank you to Carla and PeopleFit for agreeing to host our group. And I want to thank all of you guys for coming out in the rain. And I want to welcome you to our program, Time to Move, What Do I Do Now? So today we're going to talk about deciding to move and options and resources that will make the process less stressful. As Carla noted, we are members of the Senior Resource Council of Greater Boston, and we're a group of um, professionals who started out as kind of a networking, brainstorming kind of group and have morphed into a group that provide education for this that provides education for the senior community. So I'm Sari Alter. I'm a geriatric care manager, and before I go on, I'm going to introduce the rest of the panel. We have Ellen Bartnicki from Remax Encore, and she'll be talking about selling your home and independent living options. And then we have Stacy Blakesley from the residence at Pearl Street, who will discuss um, supportive living settings. And again, I'm Sari Alter. I'm a geriatric care manager. And geriatric care managers are professionals who specialize in elder care issues. I help families navigate the process of providing care for their loved ones. Um, hmm. So a geriatric care manager can provide guidance and support and provide you with the resources to deal with the challenges of aging. I've worked for, with seniors for over 15 years in a variety of settings. I'm a care manager certified and a member of the Aging Life Care Association. I'm a licensed independent clinical social worker. Back in the day, I went to law school, so I have a law degree, and I'm trained in mediation. So in my experience, deciding whether to move is one of the major stressors that elders face. It causes a lot of stress for both the elder and his or her family. So I'm going to throw out a question, and I have the answers if no one wants to answer, but why do people choose to move? Is there any ideas on why people decide it's time to move? Financial necessity. Definitely. That's a great reason. Can't manage the house. Great reason. Want to live on one level. No longer need the space. So I did a little research the first time I put on this seminar, um, and there's a push pull effect. That's a, a, a theory in migration theory, and that can be used to understand why seniors decide to move, the push-pull effect. Push factors are the reasons that you need to move, and pull factors are the benefits you will get by moving. And sometimes a decision to move is based on a combination of the needing and the wanting, or the push and the pull. So first I'm going to talk about the push factor. The push is either a trigger or a crisis that um, drives a move can no longer afford your home, can no longer manage your home. It could be a health crisis, a, lo a loss of social support. Perhaps your neighbor who used to help you run errands has moved to Arizona. Perhaps you've lost a spouse. It could be um, because of your loss of ability to drive, which in a way can be kind of um, fixed by Uber, but I once learned, I've learned how to use Uber recently. I find it a little overwhelming. So even though Uber is an option, I think sometimes it's tough for older people to get the hang of the cell phone and calling the car. Sometimes you need more care for either physical or cognitive reasons, and that's something we talked about last week. And those reasons could perhaps be a dementia or a short-term memory loss. Sometimes there's just too much home maintenance, and sometimes the home is in disrepair so it might no longer be safe. But on the other hand, when we look at a pull move, it's motivated by the anticipation of something better. It's considered more of a proactive move. And some examples of a pull move might be a move to a senior community with a lot of amenities. You're going to get the social room, you're going to get the, the steam room, and perhaps you know a, a state-of-the-art gym or a pool. Sometimes a pull move could be to a better climate after shoveling and dealing with the weather here. You might want to move to Arizona or to Florida or to North Carolina. Sometimes the move, well, maybe not North Carolina. <laughs> Bad example. That worked last time. Scratch North Carolina. Um, you might want to move closer to the kids. And you might want to move for more free time, because if you moved into a supportive setting, you might no longer have caregiver responsibilities, and you would no longer have um, home maintenance responsibilities. So a pull move can address your current needs. There are things that make you need to move now. But they can also be proactive in anticipation of future needs. So you know that that moment where you're no longer going to be able to drive is right around the corner. So you might decide to do that now until you wait until you're in the middle of a crisis. And I found in my practice, and I'm sure everybody has found that with most, most things in life, 
better to address an issue before there is a crisis, which is why a proactive move is usually less stressful for everybody. But as you will hear as um, both Ellen and Stacy speak, that you can have a um, successful move and you can minimize stress regardless of your reason for moving and regardless of the timing of your move. So I'll, they'll circle back to me at the end and I'll kind of tie it all together, but right now I'm gonna turn it over to Ellen. Hi, I'm Ellen Bartnicki. I'm a real estate agent with Remax. I've been a realtor for just about 20 years now and have helped a lot of seniors buy and sell homes through the years. Uh, things have changed an awful lot since the time I started doing this. So I'm assuming it's changed a lot since the time you bought or sold your last home. So I want to take a few minutes and go over what it takes to sell today and then talk about some independent living options that you may want to consider. Um, if you're like most people, your home is your biggest asset. So what can you do to maximize the asset? What can you do to walk away with as much money as possible after the sale? And that's where when Sari says proactive, I think if you start the process early, it gives you more time to get the house in the best shape and uh, be able to walk away with as much money as you can. Um, I would say the first step would be to reach out to a real estate agent. Ask them to do a market evaluation for you. It's free. They usually don't charge you for it. They come out, they look at your house, they walk around, they take notes. Then they'll compare your home to other homes that sold in the area. And they'll be able to give you a very good estimate as to what you can sell your house for. And that's a really good step because it helps you decide where you want to move and if it's even the right time to sell. They'll also be able to give you some advice as things to do or not do before you sell your house. Everybody panics and they think they have to put a new roof on or put new windows in. You don't. But they'll help you and they'll guide you through and tell you what you should and shouldn't do. If you're not going to get 100% back on any of the work you do, you don't want to do it. Um, after you have the evaluation done, the next step is go through your house. And this, I think, is the most difficult step. Get rid of things you don't want, you, you don't want to take with you. This can be really time consuming, and I've had um, clients where it takes them years to go through their stuff. So that's why I say be proactive and um, go through your house. If you're not using it anymore, people get rid of it, donate it, and um, go through your closets too, even clothes you no longer wear. When we're showing a house, if the closets are jam-packed and full, people think there's no storage. So just going through boxing up clothes, winter clothes if it's the spring, box them up, make that closet seem really big. Um, and then after you do that, a, a lot of agents will have a, um, a stager come out, a professional stager. They're an interior designer by trade. They're, they're excellent. And um, they'll go through each room, give you a list of things to do in every room. And this is a really good starting point because I find that most people get overwhelmed when they say, where do I start to get my house ready? And you don't even know what room to start in and what to do in each room. And I feel like people move things from one room to the other and don't really have a plan. So when the stager comes through, she'll do a formal report and tell you what to do in each room. Um, they're usually small things. They're not going to tell you to renovate a kitchen or knock down walls or do anything like that. Usually it's um, maybe getting rid of some personal photos, put them away, uh, rearranging the furniture, that's a big one, and uh, sometimes getting rid of furniture, making the room seem bigger. Uh, they may ask you to change out some lighting fixtures or paint, but again, usually not anything too big, and they oftentimes have people that can help you with that, so they're not expecting you to get up and, and um, paint a cathedral ceiling, but there are people that can help if we need it. Um, after the stager comes in and all the, you know, you've accomplished everything on the list, then a uh, professional photographer comes out. And most agents now use a professional photographer to come out and do the photo shoot and they make a video. Everything's done online now, so we have to do everything we can to have our houses stand out online. Buyers search online for their next home. If they don't like what they see, they just scroll right through and move on to the next one. They won't even schedule a showing. So with the stager and the photographer, they're so important that a lot of agents are including it now as part of their marketing package. They pay for it because they know how important it is. And houses that are staged and have the professional photography tend to sell for a lot more money, get more showings, and uh, more offers. So it's, it's definitely an important step. So it sounds easy, right? But how do you find the right real estate agent that can guide you through the process? You know, don't base it on price. 
a lot of people base it on you know what price which agent gives them the best price my recommendation would be have three agents come out to do that evaluation for you that gives you a chance to talk to them ask them questions um, find out about them how long have they been in the business how many houses have they sold um, are they a full-time real estate agent um, do they do business in this area how are they going to market your home are they going to just stick it in multiple listing service and just hope people offer on it are they going to help you get the house ready are they going to assist with photography and staging um, those those are big questions to ask um, how are they going to show you home how are they going to schedule showings are they going to do open houses for you but I think probably one of the most important things when you're looking for an agent it should be someone that's approachable someone that you feel comfortable asking questions to and someone who listens to you it can be a very stressful process and you want somebody on your side that you feel comfortable talking to keep in mind you're hiring them find the right person for you um, talk to them about communication how often do you expect to hear from them um, will they communicate by text phone email if there's a preference for you make sure you let them know let them know what your expectations are and then you're not disappointed um, so that th those are things to really look for in an agent uh, bef oh sure um, if you don't know how you're going to get out of your house yep. Yes, that's what actually I was just going to say. There's a, um, I was going to talk a little bit about a move manager. There's companies yeah, yeah. that'll come out and they'll sit down with you and they'll help with as much or as little as you need. They can help you pack. They can help you go through your stuff and decide what you want to keep and not keep. They'll even find a mover for you. They can coordinate everything. Um, the cost depends on what services you need and how much stuff you have and how long it takes. A lot of realtors do have a move manager that can help you. Yep. And I have we we met one through our group that I can give you a number to as well. And I work with some. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. So, uh, sure. Just for cost of the sale, that's the cost for the spaces or the photography. Yep. Is that all extra on the seller? Or no, a lot of agents now are paying for it. Mm -hmm. and it's part of the marketing package. Mm -hmm. So when you have the agent come out to do that evaluation. Th that's a good question to ask them. Most agents will go over their marketing plan and tell you how they plan to market your house, and um, they'll go over staging and photography. Not every agent does it, so that's why I say it's an important question to ask, because it really does help a lot. Um, so after you decide to sell, you decide what agent you're going to use. We, you do the photo shoot, we're ready to go, offers are coming in, where are you gonna go? It's always good to have a good idea where you want to move before you put your house on. <laughs> in this market, houses are selling so quick. It's good to know what, what kind of house you want, what kind of, um, you know, do you want a home, do you want a condo? Uh, some people want to sell their big house, move to a smaller house, maybe all on one level, maybe move to a condo. And they come in different sizes and styles. Some are townhouse style with bedrooms on the first floor, master bedroom. Some have bedrooms on the second floor. So that would be something you'd have to decide what's important to you there. Uh, people move to um, different locations, like Sarah said, maybe want to move to a warmer climate, get away from the snow. Um, other people move to the senior living, to 55 and older. There's even a 62 and over now in Andover. In those communities, people are drawn to them because of the amenities. A lot of them will have a pool, they'll have a gym, they'll have social activities. Some of them will have clubs and trips. They're really nice. They take care of all the snow removal. You're not worried about shoveling, mowing your grass, any of that stuff. So people do really like them. Um, and I've sold a lot of units in 55 and older communities. So there's just a few things to look out for. If you think you want one of these communities for the social aspect, make sure you check out what activities they offer. Not every 55 and older offers a lot of activities. Um, look at the calendar. They'll oftentimes have a calendar. Find out what's offered, how frequently. If there's a clubhouse, go in and look at it. Talk to some of the people that are in the clubhouse. Ask them about the activities and what they do. Find out about trips and clubs. Make sure it's what you're looking for. Um, the other thing that's important is find out if the complex is professionally managed, 
which means they have an on-site management company or an off-site company, or some are self-managed, where the owners get together and, and they enforce the rules and they collect the condo fee and handle the financial information. Um, if it's self-managed, the problem becomes if somebody he's, who's doing that decides they want to leave or they don't want to do it anymore, are you prepared to step up? Is that something you're comfortable with? Um, the professionally managed companies do tend to have a higher condo fee, but it makes life a little bit easier and some people prefer that. But a lot of people don't know whether they're professionally managed or self-managed until they get too far in the process. So that's a good question to ask. Um, another thing to look at, whether it's a 55 and older or any condominium, find out about their rules. Take a look at the rules and regulations. Um, make sure that you're comfortable with all the rules that are listed there. Probably the most common rule that people look at or inquire about is regarding pets. Not every condo complex allows pets. Some allow just inside pets. Some allow a certain number, certain size. So if you have a pet, that's something you want to find out before you fall in love with the condo. Um, another thing that people sometimes forget to look at is the financial documents from the association. Mm -hmm. Really important. When you're used to a ho living in a home, you don't even give it thought. When it's time to do a roof, you worry about the roof. But with a condo association, they have uh, money in what's called the reserve. And that money mm -hmm. is there for when it's time to do the big projects. So it's important to look at the balance sheet, the budget, and they'll give it to you. You just have to ask and find out how much money is in reserve. Find out if there's any special assessments <coughs> coming up. That's when uh, they may have a big project coming in and they don't have enough money in reserve to do it. So they may ask every seller to, uh, every owner to uh, pay a certain amount of money towards it. So if that's something that's happening, you really want to know about it before you purchase in there. So looking at the financial documents is part of the process. I also, too, usually recommend take a look at the minutes of the last owner's meetings. Usually go back like two or three meetings. See what they're talking about in the meetings. Maybe they're talking about a big project that might be done next year. Ask them if they have the money put aside to do that project. The other thing that's in the minutes of the meetings, you find out if people are <coughs> complaining about each other. You know, maybe everybody's complaining about the guy that's living right next door, so you might want to know that. So it's, it's always helpful, and it takes just 10 minutes to read through the minutes of the meetings and um, find out what's going on. It does give you a really good idea about the complex. And um, I have a question about um, limitations on whether your kids can come and live with you or stay with you. Right. Some will only allow a certain amount of time. Um, usually, if they're under 18, they cannot live with you at all. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, if they're over 18, they can. Sometimes both, everyone has to be 55 and older. Sometimes just one person. So if that's something that affects you, 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 you need to find out. Sometimes grandkids can stay for a night or two, but it's, it's in the rules on every complex. And some complexes won't allow um, grandkids to use the pool. So that's why it's important to look through everything. But a real estate agent will guide you through that as well. Let them know exactly what you're looking for in a complex. Let them know the towns you want to look in, your price point. Um, and they'll be able to do research for you as well. And they'll be able to get all those documents for you to take a look at and help you go through them. Are you talking about um, a real estate agent for the seller? You know how they have... Yep, you can have a buyer. A buyer's a, a buyer. Yep. A buyer's agent will help you. They'll, most of them will know a lot about the different complexes, but they'll be able to get you information as well. Because you want to get a copy of the rules, you want to get a copy of the budget, take a look at everything. Also, you, you probably need a good lawyer, too. A good lawyer is always good, yeah. <laughs> um, Ellen, can you serve, or can your realtor serve, sell your house as the seller's agent and then morph into your buyer's agent as yes. you purchase? Yes. And that is traditionally the same person? It's traditionally the same person if they're in the same area. Very common. Yep. They can coordinate both because they'll represent you. They're representing you for both. Okay. When there's an open house, how does one uh, take extra security measures to make sure that with all the people coming and going that one's personal things are not? That's a good question. Yep. Usually when we, when we do an open house, it depends on the size of the house. Sometimes if the house is really big and I... I this happened to me this year. I had somebody come with me. So there's somebody on the second floor, and I'm on the first floor. People usually do. You do ask them to sign into the home. 
uh, sign into the open house, put their name, but somebody could make up a name. So the most important thing is to put every valuable away. And I think the biggest thing that's been a target is um, medication. So even in your bathroom, put medication away. People ask to use the bathroom, and then they could open up the medicine cabinet and, and take medicine. It's never happened to me, but I've heard stories all the time. So it's important to put your valuables away. Is it true now with the internet and so forth, open houses aren't, I think aren't that great anymore? Open houses are a good way for people that are just thinking about whether they want to move or not, because you don't have any stress. You could go in and look at it and say, no, this isn't what I want. So I feel like people, when they're just out in the process, are more likely to go to an open house. Once you have an agent, they can take you into any house anyway. Yeah. But when you're just starting out, some people feel uncomfortable because they're not even sure if they want to move. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, going back to the fifty-five plus communities for yep. a moment, you, is one of the other things that we need to check on is what is actually covered by the monthly fee. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And that will be right on the listing. They'll tell you. Some of them will include water and sewer, some don't. Traditionally, from on a condo, you own from the walls in. But a good question is who's responsible for the windows okay. most of the time. You're, you're, every time you talk about the 55 plus, you're referring to them as a condo. Is it in Massachusetts, are they all most condos? All the ones that I'm aware of are condos. Some are standalone condos, and they feel like a home. But it's a condo because you don't own the land that it's on, and the um, they take care of the maintenance of the yards and everything else. Okay, so if you're moving to another state, that is something that you can Sometimes. confirm and make sure that whatever community you're looking at, it covers the types of things that you're looking to have. Exactly, to exactly, yes. And even if they cover snow removal on the driveway, you want to make sure that they also shovel the walkway and your steps and so forth. Yep. Are any of these ever rentals, or are they always? There's some rentals. Some rentals. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Not too many, though. I'm surprised, but. On the standalone condos, is that leased land when it's an individual unit? It's an individual unit, and the associate, the, um, it's not leased land, though, no. Not the ones that I've dealt with. I've, I've seen some with leased land up in Maine, but I haven't seen any around here. So you buy the building proper, building formal, but the land underneath of that is Is owned by the, so is owned by the, um, Okay, yeah. so if you get involved with a contract in something like that, and the people who own the land decide to do something completely different, or well, the that's motivation changes, <coughs> yeah. what, happens to their responsibility for doing all the things that is in the agreement. Um, that's more with lease land. So if you're leasing the land, whoever owns the land can do that. Mm -hmm. This is um, a condominium, so the association owns the land. They won't, cha they won't change their mind and do something different because okay. it, it's, right. it's built for the condo. But with lease land, that is a very common question. Because you're leasing the land, they could the next year say, no, I don't want to lease you the land anymore. And what are you going to do, pick up your house? And so, the, so what you're saying is the uh, building on top of uh, land is owned by the as condo association. Yes, right. and you you actually own a certain percentage of the land, like built into your deed. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Any other questions? All right, now Stacy's going to talk about some um, other living options with more support. Hi, and I'm Stacy Blakesley. I um, and the sales and marketing director at the residence of Pearl Street in Reading. Um, I'm a social worker. I've been doing elder care for over 20 years. I started um, as a case manager at Mystic Valley Elder Services, worked in information services, uh, protective services, as well as helped start the elder care advisor program for the state of Massachusetts. Um, I went on and became a memory care director. Uh, I've been a managed care case manager for insurance companies and the director of admissions for a nursing home. Um, which ultimately have le led me to this position, which I've been doing for the last three years. Um, so really what I'm here to talk to you today about is senior living options and the d different types of senior living options. So my question to you would be, what is your opinion? What, what do you think of senior living? I like it. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> okay, that's, that's a new one. I don't always start that way. Um, so that was good. So really, yeah, okay, that's what I'm more used to. Um, so in terms of what Ellen was talking about in independent living, so there are those standalone communities, and those are for people really who are healthy, young, well, want to have their own private property, can still maintain some of that property. But the, the thought on that is that to know that you don't have services there. So those services aren't there. Some people choose to go into an independent living that's offered in an assisted living community because you can, if your needs increase, have supportive services that are right on staff to come and support you. Now, one of the things that you want to look at is some and assisted livings do it many different ways. Some do it that they have an independent living and then you have to move when you're no longer considered independent living and now you're going to be getting some services, you have to move to a different part of the building. Other places don't have that. You're able to stay in your own apartment and continue whether you were independent or getting assisted living. So these are questions that as you ask yourself as I'm looking into these things, would that be important to me? Did I spend three years here and now I have to move and I don't want to do that? Those are all things to consider when you're starting to look at that. Um, some of these can be more of a campus-like setting. So that could be you, you buy into an independent living, then as you, you needs increase, you then move to then the assisted living. And then as your needs increase, say you had to go to the memory area or you needed the nursing facility. So there's a couple types of different options. We're not inundated in this area with a lot of campus-like settings. There are some of those options. Um, but the more that you'll hear about is what Ellen was discussing and independent living as well in assisted living. Um, what you'll probably hear most about is assisted living. So assisted living is offering supportive services for those people in a residential se setting. So that could be assistance with bathing, dressing, it could be queuing for medications, it could be actually helping to take medicines, it could be escorting to and from meals or activities, um, it could be you've just come from the hospital, you say you had a broken hip and you're just not comfortable, you don't want to be in those hallways alone, people walking back and forth with you. Um, it could be, you know, you, you have to put on those god-awful Ted stockings. Those are so hard to get on and off. The, the, the people who work there are able to come in and able to assist you with that. Really the nice part about the assisted living is they can kind of tailor their needs to what your needs are. So everybody gets an individualized care plan. And in this care plan, it tells the people who are working there how we're caring for you. So is that reminding you for medicines, or is that bringing you down for meals, or is that showering you? These are all different things that can be looked at. Um, some of the things is, and, and, and Sari did mention this as well, there's a lot of different amenities at, at places, and when you're looking, you may look at three, four, five places, and a lot of them offer the same things. Maybe they offer a parking spot and maintenance and a pool or a hot tub or uh, all these different things. And, and you really have to look at how that benefits you. Is that something, if you've never been a person who's gone into a hot tub, chances are good that you're not going to start going into a hot tub. So maybe that has no bearing on how you're going to make your next decision for your next steps. Um, you know, a lot of assisted livings will offer a hairdresser who's on site, and for exactly what you said, for those winter months when people can't get out, it's there, you don't have to try to get out if you're, if you're fearful to, to go out in bad weather. Um, a lot of assisted livings have a doctor that will come in and be your primary care physician, um, but you don't have to use that person. They may have hearing, vision, dental, and podiatry services that come in. Um, again, they're just amenities that are offered. They're not, they don't work directly for these assisted livings, but it's services that are provided to residents so that it's less that the family has to worry about providing. Um, and most of the places will offer, off, also offer transportation so that they can take you to and from doctor's appointments, but also to and from you know, any scheduled activities. Like you said, they go out to meals or they go out to a museum. Um, so those are things that you want to look at. You had a question? I was, I was going to say, all those things are at an extra cost. Doctors, dentists, all those costs. So uh, <laughs> in, in terms of the doctors and the dentists, that will continue as if you lived at home alone. So you've got your Medicare and you've got your supplemental insurance. It that would go through your insurance the same way. 
Um, some of the things that are included in the monthly rent would be your meals, your weekly housekeeping, your linen laundry, or your laundry services. Some people get a personal emergency response system, so some people choose the, the watch or the pendant. And that's nice because it's not like the one that you wear at home where it goes to the fire department and everybody knows you may have had a fall. <laughs> this is, you know, most of the places have a beeper, we have a phone system, and it lets us know that the resident in apartment 122 needs assistance or tells us in the building where that resident is so we can respond in a timely fashion. Um, it, again, it will provide a tra transportation, it will provide the care plan staffing 24 hours a day. Um, the thing that you want to look at when you're looking at these different places is there's different in terms of a la carte services and all-inclusive. So an all-inclusive place includes the meals, it includes the housekeeping, it includes the transportation, it includes all those things. Um, and when you're first looking at that, you may say, wow, that's, that's more expensive than what I was looking at. Because when you're looking at an a la carte place, you're looking at the cost of the apartment, that was one cost. Then you're looking as you have care and add care, that increases the cost. And then some places also charge differently for medications. So if you go from two medicines to four medicines, that may be a higher level that they're charging you. So sometimes it may seem like, oh, this, this is less expensive, but really when you're starting it to add in care and medications, it can be just as expensive, if not more expensive. So when you're looking, you really wanna ask yourself a couple things. One is what, is, what benefits me? What really is important to me? What is important to my family? The other thing is you want to look at, I tell people, a minimum of three places. Just like you said, have a, you know, people come in. There's a lot of us out there. That doesn't mean that you should see 20 communities because after a while, they're all going to start to run together. You're not going to know what place said what, what did what. You really want to narrow down. Do you have a specific area that you want to be in? Um, do you want to be close to your children? or you know, if you've lived in Woburn your whole life and Woburn is the area that you know you're most comfortable in, then maybe you want to just check in that area and what works for you. Um, the nice part is most places now offer what's called a respite or a trial stay. So the nice part about that is you can come in and trial that. So a lot of them will do it for 30 days and you can extend it on the other end if you need to, but it's just trying it. So I have, I have people who come in, like I said, I've been there for three years and I have my, my winterers with me. Um, they come in every October and November and they stay through March. I have, um, there was a fire last year in Reading. We accommodated some people until they were able to get up and get new housing. Um, one of the things that we come across a lot of times is that people have may have had a fall, they've had an illness, and they've gone to a rehab setting. And then at that point, the rehab, the insurance company says, okay, you've kind of reached a plateau. You're not making any more progress. We, we, you have to move along at this point. But they may say, you're not ready to go home yet independently, or you, we feel like you're going to need some more care for an extended period of time. We see a lot of people who will come to us and do a respite stay coming directly from a rehab. So um, currently I have two people right now um, who, two people who had a fall, broke different things, did their acute rehab, did their time in the skilled nursing facility, and then it just got to the point where the insurance company said, okay, you're not really making progress at this point, whether you're non-weight bearing or you're just, you've been pretty plateau with progress. Um, so we really think that you need to move on to the next level. But they said you need 24-hour supervision. 24-hour supervision is something that can be addressed in assisted living. So that means that somebody is there 24 hours a day. That doesn't mean that eyes are on you 24 hours. That doesn't mean you can't be in your own apartment with doors closed. You certainly can. It means that the help is available to you 24 hours a day. There's a nurse there or there's a nurse on call. There's people there that if you did need assistance toileting or transferring, the people are there that they would be able to help you. Um, one of the nice things that we've seen, and it's developed over the years because the senior living industry has changed so much, is we can do incontinence care, especially when somebody has had a fall and, and they're in a cast or they have a whole change, you've had a traumatic event, sometimes that will be something that happens and we can put in a continence program. There's different things that are out there that can meet these needs. Um, recently I had somebody who I've 
been working with for a very, very long time in the community, and I'd see, I see them at my events and, and run into this person oftentimes, um, and she just hadn't been feeling herself. And I, and I knew her, and I was actually at an event recently, and I saw her and said, you know, you don't see yourself, and she said, I'm not, and I said, okay. I called her the next day when I went back, can I call your daughter? I, I really think we have some concerns here. She allowed me to call her daughter. I went to the house, met the daughter there. The daughter was able to take her to the hospital. She ended up having a hospitalization um, and then doing some time in a skilled nursing facility. And then she came to us um, to do a 30-day respite just to see if she liked it, to see if she strengthened and how she would do. She's now currently in the process of becoming a permanent resident. But, you know, she loved the things, the amenities. She loved having the meals. Things she, you know, things when I first talked to her, I can make my own meals. Now she tells me, I don't want to do that anymore. I've been doing that for 62 years. I'm not doing that anymore. Um, you know, she likes the fact that she doesn't have to, even if she doesn't need help in the shower, somebody's right outside of the shower for her if she needs that. Um, she likes the fact that we're not going to, we're checking on her a minimum of every meal to make sure that she's eaten what she's eaten. Um, you know, it's a lot of nice safety features for people, and it's a lot of less worry for the families. Um, now, the memory care is something that you've probably heard a lot about over the last few years. There's more, that can be two options. That can be memory care and an assisted living. So that's an assisted living community that offers another area with memory care. Or that can be a standalone community, much like an independent community. And that's where the whole specialty will be just memory. So the things that you want to look at when doing that is a memory care community, whether it be its own community, whether it be in an assisted living, they're going to be, provi be providing more care. So more care in terms of with help with all your activities of daily living. So bathing, dressing, med management, meal preparation, transferring if you require that. Those are all things that these specialty communities can provide. The things that you really want to look for when you're doing that is you want to look at education. You want to look at training. You want to make sure it's a company that values how they're educating their staff and a company that's investing in continuing to have the staff go through training, whether they're certified dementia practitioners, whether they're um, brass ring dementia certified. You want to make sure that these are things that is continuing to happen so that the people who are on the floor who are caring for us, our loved ones, are people who are continually being educated and um, knowledgeable about the, about the disease process. Um, the thing that we talked about a little bit with the uh, independent is the continuing care communities. And I won't say that I'm an expert on this at, by any means. Um, but the continuing care community is something that you do a buy-in. So you're buying, usually people come in and start at the independent level, and then they move to the next level, which is the assisted level, or the memory care, or the nursing facility. Um, those have a buy-in. So other places like an assisted living will just have a monthly lease. This has a large buy-in, and then you will have some fees monthly that you have to do. For some people, that's the type of living they want to do. They know they want to be in it. It's more of a campus-like setting. For some people, they're very comfortable with that, and that's how they want to be. Other people know, that's not for me. I don't like the largeness of it. That's something that, again, by you taking a tour, by you seeing, you'd get a better feel what would work for you. Um, and then everybody knows about nursing homes. So there is definitely a time and a place for nursing home. And that's when usually you've reached, you've gone through other senior living aspects and you're unable to, they're unable to provide the level of care that you need. So they're saying at that point that you need 24 hour care. Um, they're saying whether it be you have a medical reason for that, you've, you need nurses that are there 24 hours. Um, maybe you need a Hoyer lift, which is an actual lift that's moving you. Maybe you're on a continuous G-tube feed. There is a time and a place for a nursing home. And the same goes for when you're touring nursing homes. See different nursing homes. Walk in, get the feel. See if you can talk to staff. See if you can talk to other residents. Nobody's going to give you better information than other residents or other residents' families. Um, one of the things that Ellen mentioned is everybody does things online now. And they do. Everybody does things online. Everybody, you can write a review of everything. You can go to the restaurant down the street and go on Yelp and write a review. The thing that I caution you about that is anybody can write a review. 
just because you heard a good or a bad thing about a place doesn't mean that's necessarily true. That means that could be a former disgruntled employee. That means that could be somebody who worked there 22 years ago and liked it and doesn't have a job now. You know, you really have to keep that in mind. Um, and the best thing that I tell everybody, and I tell anybody who comes to Taurus this, is bring that up. Talk to the people about that. Talk to the person that you're meeting with. Talk, ask to speak to the executive director so they can directly speak to you about what, some, what the issue could have been or how that was addressed, what the plan of action is when there is an issue. Um, because there's no place that I know of, and I've been doing this a long time, that doesn't want to meet the needs of the residents and doesn't want people to succeed. Um, I think that that's the most important thing for everybody is that we want to meet people's needs and we want you to succeed. Um, and everybody knows that not every place is for them. You will get the feeling when you do your tours, like, okay, this is a place that I want to come back again. You should ask, can I come back again and try a meal? Because let's be honest, we all are looking forward to our meals. We need to know that you like the food. The food is prepared the way that you want the food to be prepared. It's not too salty for you if you're on a specialized diet. These are things that are really important. So I always suggest that you come back, try the food, speak with other residents um, in the dining room. They're, they're going to give you the true, true story, what they think of that. So I think that that's a, a great step. Um, so people always ask me, how do people pay for assisted living, continuing care, any of these things? So I usually tell people there's a few different ways. One is Ellen said, you have a home. The home is your biggest asset. Um, two is some people have long-term care insurance policies. Now these long-term care insurance policies would have been things that you have purchased at some point that you've been paying towards. Um, you will have to have, you will have to meet certain criteria for those. Um, you have to have certain level of need, so you will have a medical component to that, that you will have to have an assessment done by a medical professional to make sure that you're meeting those needs. Um, and then the third area is the Veterans Aid and Attendance Benefit. Now this is a wonderful benefit. So this is a benefit for surviving spouses or for the veteran themselves who they served 90 days of active duty during a wartime period but one of those days is an actual day of duty. So it doesn't mean that you ever saw that duty, but you have to be active during a wartime period for one day. Um, and there is income guidelines for this program. There's also making sure that you have to, again, those activities of daily living that I addressed with you, you need to have one of those needs. So it could be eating, bathing, dressing, continence, or transferring. Um, they, I tell people it's the veterans, so you will fill out the application. It can take, it can be a lengthy time. The nice part is from the time that your application re is received, um, it goes retroactive. So even if they don't get to your application till six months later, you will, if you qualify, get a check at the end of that back to the six months of the original date of the application. I tell people the best people you can talk to about that are your veterans agent for the town. We're so lucky in Massachusetts that we have veterans agent. Even just going to New Hampshire, we don't have that. Um, or an attorney. An attorney will be able to help you with that, help you with the application process, because it can be a lengthy process, but guide you in the right direction um, and really go over that. Does anybody have any questions on? Yep. Um, what is the situation with assisted living when we're talking about a uh, couple? Mm -hmm. One is in need, but the other one is independent. Yep. How is that usually handled in an assisted living situation? So I think that's the great part is places do that very differently. I know how we do that is we want a couple to stay together. I mean, that's everybody's goal is to have the couple together. So there's often times that that exact situation will happen. You have an ind a spouse who needs some assistance and the other spouse who's doing well, but it's just too much to be at home. Um, so they may come in on the assisted living side and you may keep that person independent or maybe they want a couple meals per day. You can certainly accommodate that. While the other person may be needing some of that care, that's fine. Um, there is usually a second person fee depending upon the amount of services that the person gets. So whether it be, you know, so, so that that person is getting the same services that the person that they're coming in for. Um, one of the things that we do see and in, in we can accommodate is for those who are caring for a loved one with a memory issue. 
So some people will come in and do the traditional side, and they may be okay on the traditional side, and as somebody's needs increase, they may start to, that person may need to go to the memory area. Um, so currently we have a couple who, um, they live on our traditional side, a husband and wife, and the husband goes down daily to our memory area. And he does that so that the wife has some time throughout the day that she can go out, she can be independent, go to the things that she enjoys. Um, but that we know he's well cared for, he's safe, he's in a safe environment, he's, he's eating well. Um, so he goes there seven days a week um, for the morning, and then she likes him to be with her at the meal time. And then we're caring for him at night to get him ready for bed and get him set. We've had other couples who've been on the traditional side, and after a period of time that hasn't worked anymore, it's just become too much for the loved one, and they've been able to move to their memory area side, and then that, indivi you know, that in, um, individual spouse is able to go up to the assisted living side and do all their activities and have their meals. We'll do, in any place, really we'll try to accommodate whatever the, f the needs are of that individualized person. Can I interject for a minute? Sure. That's the beauty of a community like Stacy's that has a memory care unit integrated into it. It gives you that flexibility. If you put um, move a loved one into a standalone memory care unit and then the well spouse needs some more care, there's not any option for them to join each other. So that's an example of where having these different options in a building, even when you put your loved one or you place your loved one, it might not seem important. If there's a chance that the well spouse might want to join them, you need to look at a, a community like Pearl Street. And for me, I say to people, I think it's so important. People will be like, oh, we just want to go in and there's a room. That's not a room. That's your apartment. We want you to put your things in there. Those are your things that have meaning to you. You put as many pictures as you want on the wall. You know, you bring in your furniture, your comforter, things that matter to you. That will help to make it feel at home. Some of the things I know people really worry about is the transition period and how does that work. And some of the things that we can do is we usually have a resident buddy. So somebody who's going to come in and talk to you when you first come in, introduce themselves, maybe sit at a meal with you, introduce you to some of the other residents there, um, take you to and from some of the activities, as well as staff that will help you do that. I tell people very honestly, this is the social worker in me, Sari will say the same thing. There is a transition period that if for somebody to say that there isn't a transition period, that's just not realistic. There will be, but I've been doing this for a long time and I don't see people who don't transition. I think sometimes it's harder on the families than it is truly on the residents because the residents now maybe have been living at home and not had so much engagement and not eating well. Now they're getting three full meals a day and being engaged and all of a sudden went to the PBD Essex Museum and they went here on Friday and they went shopping. You know, they're doing great and I know it's very, very difficult for the families. And most places like ourselves, we offer a support group for the families to help that transition. Um, at your place, you don't have Right, we, so we offer, um, we offer assisted living in independent. I am one of those all-inclusive communities. So there's not a ton of us, but we are all-inclusive. So no matter what, everybody automatically gets 45 minutes of care included. Um, so that would be something to decide if that you want that. I do have residents who are completely independent and drive and, you know, going about their day. And then I have other pe people who don't want to do that. Um, it really just depends. The nice part about my building is if you did come in independently, you don't have to move to a different apartment when you do need services. And that's what I was saying in the beginning. Sometimes you communities are set up that you come in independently, but when you need services, then you have to move. So you have to ask, your family has to ask, is that important to you? You know, do I want to make another move or do I not want to make an, another move? So an independent person can go to your place? Absolutely. Assisted Absolutely. And we do that simply, mine is a, a financing issue. Um, ours is because we offer a lower income subsidy program um, that we've offered through the town of Reading. That's why we're not, we can't be completely independent. It's just how the financing happens through the bank. Um, but there are some places who are completely, I have sister properties that are completely independent. It just, it's just how your financing has come through. I forgot what I was going to say. Can you explain that a little bit more, um, the financing? Or? Uh, it's meaning how your bu building was financed. So we, we were financed through a bank, and we said to the town of Reading, we're going to offer this program for 99 years. 
and because of this program we're not allowed to just be independent we can have independent residents but because of this program we have to be classified as an assisted living with a memory care That's interesting. so what that the other places like that that say assisted but they most most places offer the three levels the independent the assisted and the memory care it's just dependent how you're building who your investors are and how you were financed and what that would mean in a practical way is that you would be paying for care that you may not need at this moment and if that is something that you can afford then you can grow into that care but you still can live in that building I wanted to piggyback on something you said about having to move an apartment if you had to move from independent to assisted sometimes it's just moving an apartment but I've been in communities where once you leave independent you're in a different dining room mm -hmm. you're in a different wing of the building you do movie nights on different days and so it, sometimes it's a small shift because you've moved from unit here to unit there but sometimes it's a big shift because you've kind of left your friends behind mm -hmm. so I really like the model that any apartment can shift from independent to assisted with additional care. That doesn't work well with memory care because memory care, smaller closets, um, might not have a working kitchenette, so you can't really do that. But the shift from independent to assisted doesn't have to be that profound. Right, and, and I think when, when you say that mm -hmm. the shift to, to memory care, the things you wanna do, with, like internally recently, we had somebody who's been living there for a very long time. Um, she was just really struggling. And we've know, we know her and we know her well and noticed that she was struggling in, in the dining room, she was struggling with activities, and it was really hard for the daughter, really hard for her to come to that decision. We had multiple meetings with her, and so finally I, I called her and said, will you just come in, I want you to sit in an activity with me to watch your mom, to see how we see her struggling. Mm -hmm. And then when the daughter came in and saw an activity that was one of her favorite things that she used to do, she was you know, buttoning and unbuttoning her sweater, her daughter realized she's struggling. So really what we did was when we moved her to the memory area, what that does is that helps reduce her world a little so it's not so overstimulating, it's not so loud. There's choice, but there's not a hundred choices. There's a couple choices. She still can choose her meal, she still has activities. But sometimes in doing that, you create less confusion and that's really the goal of when somebody's moving somebody to a memory care is to help with some of that. So Stacy, I'm going to pick up again sure. and then there'll be time for questions at the end. Um, so we've presented a lot of information to you and it's a lot of overwhelming information and, and some of it is kind of like um, you might be coming in at a certain point in the process and not everything that we've all said would apply to your situation. And um, this is where a geriatric care manager can really help you sort through this information. Um, so as I said earlier, the GCM is a navigator, and a lot of people ask me, where can you find a good geriatric care manager? So you can find one through word of mouth. You can find one through your aging services access point, which in this area I believe is Minuteman. Mm -hmm. Minuteman offers um, low-cost and free geriatric care management services mm -hmm. to people who qualify financially, and they offer private pay financial services, um, finan private pay geriatric care management services to people with more resources. And you can go on the Aging Life Care Association website where they'll give you a list of geriatric care managers by zip code, and I'm also on that site. Um, so when is the best time to call a geriatric care manager? And what we had talked about is that proactive is always better. Crisis things don't always go as well. But um, if you can't reach out early or before there's a crisis, a geriatric care manager can step in at any point of the process and offer you some guidance and support. Um, so what can a GCM do for you? Um, they can help you with decision making, especially if you're unsure um, what, um, what kind of community might work for you. Unlike a realtor like Ellen who can tell you the nuts and bolts of a community, I would never try to do that. But I can help you kind of sort through perhaps alternatives that your realtor might offer to you or perhaps alternatives in assisted livings or whether one assisted living could meet your needs better than another. So that's something that a GCM can do for you. They can help you decide what part of the process is important to you. I was talking to a client who um, was weighing out the location of a setting versus the setting not having a full kitchen inside and helping this client decide whether location was more important 
or being able to do some light cooking was more important. That's something your GCM can kind of work through with you. A GCM can also facilitate communications between you and your spouse. You're saying you love your community, your spouse not so much. Um, between you and your kids, your kids might think it's time to move, that things aren't going well, and you have a different idea of, of how things are going or what you want. A GCM can come in and help you figure that out. And sometimes your kids are in disagreement, and the disagreement between your kids about what should be doing, what you should be doing next, is really filtering down to you. And, and you're saying, hey, wait a minute, I'm in this equation as well. It's not just about you kids fighting it out. And a GCM can help you with that. And as I said earlier, um, I can help you sort through the options that are available. Is it a smaller house, or really is it a senior community? Is going into independent living maybe a stopgap? And if you really looked forward a little more, you might see, hey, assisted living may be right around the corner, and maybe I should be looking at a bigger picture. Um, also, a geriatric care manager can help you stay in your current setting. So one of the things that Ellen had pointed out is that senior living doesn't come with its, over 55 communities doesn't come with its own set of services. But as we talked about at the last session, there are a lot of other things that can help you remain in your setting. So maybe you wanna stay in your 55 plus community a little longer, and a geriatric care manager can help you arrange for some home care or other things that would make that possible. Sometimes you're in an assisted living, and a good assisted living, and I know Stacy is great at this, can help you access resources that will let you stay out of a nursing home perhaps a little longer, and perhaps for good, but if you're at an assisted living that perhaps doesn't have that skill level or that kind of insight, a GCM could meet with the team and say, hey, what if we put in a couple of extra hours of care? Or what if we did this? Or what if we did that? So a GCM can help you stay where you are longer. A GCM can help you with applications if you choose to move. A GCM can help you work with your long-term care insurance. There is an elimination period with most long-term care insurances. It's hard to understand. GCM can help you figure out whether you're accessing those days and moving through your elimination period. A GCM can help facilitate the moving process. Every one of us here knows move managers. Um, a GCM might help you a la carte it a little better so you're not paying the whole big move management fee, but that's something a GCM can work, you, work with you on. And we can identify and refer you to professionals, such as realtors, such as move managers, such as introducing you to assisted living communities. And unlike going on the internet, when you're working with a geriatric care manager, they're helping you narrow through the resources that you're finding. Um, and the other thing a GCM can do is help you organize and coordinate your team. So you're working with a realtor, you're working with a move manager, you're working with a home care agency, and the GCM can kind of play point on that. Um, and then the other thing that we can do is help you with some temporary solutions. What are you doing between your, how your house is sold quicker than you expected and you need to land someplace else? We can help you sort through that. And Stacy had talked about the benefits of an interim stay, which might be a trial run or might be we're on the way from here to here and we're going to spend a few months at assisted living. Um, so that's how a GCM can work with the other professionals that you're working with. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know that I offer a free consultation, so if anyone wants to reach out to me with any questions, I'm always available to do that. And I just wanted to open it up and see if you had anything else to add. Yeah, any questions at all, I'm happy to help. Even if it's not today, take my card, send me an email. I'm happy to answer any questions. And um, before we go to Q&A, I just want to mention next week's program. It's actually um, Thursday. We had to just... Sarah's going on a wonderful trip, so we had to just move these around a little. Um, but on next Thursday at 2 o'clock is the Legal and Financial Issues for Seniors and Their Families with Attorney Stephen DiGregorio. Um, so that's that's really a, a great service, and Carla had mentioned it's, it's filling up pretty quickly, so sooner rather than later, if you'd sign up for that, that would be great. Um, and now I'd like you to, to open it up to any questions that you might have for any of us. Can you give some very broad price ranges for So in terms of pricing, so pricing, 
we all shop each other. It's, uh, we, we share pricing with each other, so none should be down here and the others are up here. We're all pretty much in the vicinity of each other. Um, independent, again, I can't speak 100% to this because I, we, we're not an independent place, um, but that usually an apartment is around probably 4,000, maybe a little higher a month. Um, you may have, and then in assisted living, it could be, you know, 55 to 7,000. And again, it's going to depend on the size of apartments. It could be studio, one bedroom, two bedroom. It all depends on the size apartment that you're choosing. Um, and then memory care, that would be a little more expensive because you're adding more care. They all offer more care there. So it depends on, again, the size apartment. It could be roughly 6,500, 7,500, you know, it's just going to depend on what you're choosing in there and what really, you know, if you're doing an a la carte service as opposed to an all-inclusive place, those are the things that, that you really look at. In terms of can an assisted living keep you out of a nursing home longer, the answer is simply yes. Um, there is a time and a place, like I said, for a nursing home, but you definitely will sustain much longer in an assisted living and just like Sari said somebody like Sari somebody who has some resources can help you that even if you were advancing and needing more and more care in assisted living there are options out there I feel so lucky that working in Massachusetts I don't live in Massachusetts so I'm really telling you this um, we have so many more resource, resources and so many more options here than so many places we have the options of home care, we have the options of hospice, we have the options of assisted living, of memory care, of nursing home. We're, so many places are, are, are limited to that. So by staying in an assisted living, there are options of bringing in private pay help, like Chris was here last week. There's options of using the same staff that's there at an assisted living. There's options of, you know, somebody like me would get in touch with, with Sari and say, I really think this family needs a higher level of help. Can you get involved? Um, there's options and it will sustain. There's many people who never have to go to a nursing home. We partner with many hospices to keep people at home. We want people to stay at home. But there is a time and a place that sometimes that just doesn't work. And we'll be very honest with you. I know we as a team meet with the families to discuss when that's coming. Um, or, you know, some, sometimes it happens that something happened at the hospital and somebody's got this huge new baseline or they have a diagnosis that's really significant, that's when you start to bring in the meetings. And, and I have to say, all the skilled nursing facilities in the area are wonderful about including us in the meetings and saying, this is what we're seeing, How, have you seen this? So we can help the families prepare for the next level if that's needed or prepare to bring them home with some extra help. Um, and Stacy, I just wanted to add um, that sometimes I've always thought, oh, this family or this person is too involved to go to assisted living, and we I've reached out to Stacy, and Stacy's like, no, no, we can manage them. So I've learned a lot about that as well. That you might think that your loved one is needs too much care to go to assisted living, and that is often not the case. And the second thing I wanted to say is that assisted livings have different flavors and different philosophies. Absolutely. Some assisted livings are like, yes, if you have to, we can keep your loved one here until the last minute. It's going to cost you $20,000 a month because we're going to add in all this care, but we'll let that happen. And other assisted livings like to say along the lines of we're a pure assisted living. So their philosophy is when your loved one hits a certain level of care, they don't care how much money you have. They don't feel like they can do your loved one a good service and they want you to transition on and I think when you're looking at assisted livings that's maybe a good question to ask what's your philosophy if we have the resources to keep a loved one here what's your philosophy of, of playing it out through the end or are you a pure assisted living and are you eager to transition that person on to the next setting and that's just another question that kind of comes into the mix right and years ago, you may have toured an assisted living or it was an independent, and you'd see, you know, everybody was walking and talking and driving, and, and you will go into an assisted living because it, it's, it's been a 20-year process now, and like we said, it's evolved. Yes. So you will see people now when you walk into an assisted living that are on a cane or a walker or possibly a wheelchair. You know, and a lot of people will say, well, that's not me. I don't, I don't want to see that. But it is the reality because people are staying home longer. People are then coming to assisted living much later. So their needs are increased. And that is, you have to say, okay, talk to the people who are touring you, talk to the executive director, talk to the team about how that can affect your loved one and how maybe they can come in. You know, I tell people, 
a lot of times they're not ready for a tour and that's okay you don't have to be ready for a tour come in and listen to the activity you know come and listen to the music that we have on Sunday night no pressure come in and have a meal we won't give you a tour because that's to admit that you are there that's taking a first step and that's not always easy and we know that so sometimes it's just getting creative around how different ways that we can accommodate a loved one and I want to say that if you go into an assisted living, um, I've been in this business for quite a while and I've toured all the assisted livings, and I go in and I go, yeah, I could see myself here and yeah, I could see myself there because I never felt the stigma of looking at it as an older person. I started looking at them when I was in my late 40s and early 50s. You will be pleasantly surprised how beautiful they are and some of them look like hotels, some of them are homier. Um, <laughs> Stacy's has an amazing vibe because it's an old school. So. Just even if you're not going seriously, I, I've been looking at um, one level apartments, even though I'm not ready for them. When I see an open house, I go and see what a one, what a one level apartment looks like um, in a two family. So I suggest that even if you're not ready, take advantage of the kind of opportunities that Stacy is talking about, because you might be incredibly pleasantly surprised at what you see when you go into a community. I would, that's, I think with me, that's the thing. And Sari and I talk about this all the time. We're social workers first. So I'm going to say to you, there are times that that can't happen for whether it be for a financial reason or whether that be because your needs have just increased so much. I would never, I would never personally set somebody up to fail. If I, and I have, I have, you know, somebody's come to us and they've said, you know, I want, I, recently we, we, um, a family wanted us to screen somebody at a nursing home who had been living at a nursing home for a year. I had doubts from the very beginning, and I was very honest with the family. I have very, I very much have concerns about this. So I brought the nurse in. This is what she's saying. This is what we're seeing, um, and these are my concerns. And I said it in front of the family. We then had the nurse go out and do an assessment, and we sat down with the family after and said we're just not comfortable. That's not to say that it wasn't the care that we could provide, but maybe after a year of getting used to 24-hour care of of nurses being there 24 hours, of not being in an apartment, not being behind a closed door, I had safety concerns for that person. So really it would be how, what those needs, are. I think every case is very individualized and I, I see that more as the time has gone on, that nothing is cookie cutter anymore, nothing is simple, easy, there's so many things that are involved into that, there's so many things that are involved into a nursing home discharge or a skilled nursing home discharge that we need to meet those needs, but we need to have a good plan in place in order to do that, and that's where the assessment comes in. Stacy, would you take, um, would you let someone who now needed a Hoyer lift remain in the building? We, so we don't do Hoyer lifts at my building. Uh, we, our philosophy is that we feel that there's a time and place that that needs medical supervision. If the family was willing to provide private pay help to do that, then yes. But we would not take upon that responsibility because the philosophy of our company, which is LCB, is that that needs a, a medical, a real medical professional handling that 24 hours a day. So that's kind of the exa that's kind of like the bright line <clears throat> example where I've worked in buildings and people have gone home and they've been in a cyst of two or maybe three, and that building is saying, yes, if you can provide that care, we're definitely going to let you do it. And yes, we encourage people on Hoyers to stay, and we might provide our own staff at an additional cost. Some buildings like Stacy's are more of a hybrid where they're going to do it kind of reluctantly, but they're going to put the responsibility back on the family to access the staff and oversee that it's a safe situation there's some buildings that say no we have no Hoyers in our building and that's kind of where you get to the philosophy of the building does that make sense Absolutely. and for us I won't take anybody in who starts at a two-person assist simply and this is my own philosophy as well as the executive director because she is a social worker as well is that we don't want to set you up to fail. So I don't want to take somebody in who's already a two-person assist and in three months now, now they need a Hoyer lift or now they can't do that at all. All I've done, what, what service did I do to somebody? I've set them up to fail. So we, that's our philosophy. If somebody has lived with us and they've aged in place and they now become a two-person assist, that's fine. We'll do that. We're not going to move somebody on for that. 
but I wouldn't start that way because I just don't think it's the, f the right step for somebody. Ellen, yeah. um, with regard to downsizing, yep. there's a lot, people have a lot of belongings that probably have some value, but they just can't take it with them. Yep. So as opposed to putting everything out to the curb, <laughs> what are the options of giving, uh, having people come in and taking the stuff and maybe getting some value? There are companies place? that'll come out and they'll look at your belongings and they'll, they'll um, auction them off for you. And um, I had somebody do that last year because they were moving to California and she couldn't take everything with her. And it was an auction company that came out. They, she was an older woman and she had a lot of stuff. And they threw out everything that needed to be thrown out, anything with the value, they kept it, and then they sold it. And of course, they kept a portion of it, mm -hmm. but then she was compensated for that. But they were able to come in and say, we can work with this, yes. this yep. goes. And even the stuff that went, she couldn't physically move it, they did that as part of it. They charged her for that as well. Okay. <coughs> um, Ellen, I have a question, or maybe Gary, you know, um, are there any either online or, or folk resources where you can you want to be proactive to, to know <coughs> the downsides, yep. but are you really ready to be proactive? <laughs> <laughs> so, what, so what are you thinking, like, how, like year negative two do this, year negative one do this, like a timeline kind of? No, not I think that that's really the hard work that you have to do on your own. I mean, I think we all, I mean, Stacey and I are actually social workers and I'm a clinical social worker, so I don't do therapy as part of my practice, but I wear some of that hat when it comes to dealing with these issues. And that, the, 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 the short answer is that's like your own personal work. A GCM can support you in that. Your friends can support you in that. Ellen can give you the options. Stacy can give you the options. I think we all struggle with that. You know, are your kids really out of the house? Is one of them unsettled? One of them married? The one who isn't really settled? Is that house an anchor for them? And I think that these are really hard questions that we start even dealing with. I'm, I'm 59 and I'm starting to deal with these questions. These are questions that take a long time to percolate. A GCM can definitely support you with that and just kind of help you brainstorm. Other professionals too, counseling professionals can help you with that. But I think that these questions at every step are the hardest part of the process. What does it mean for my family? Where are we going to have Christmas? Oh, we're in the assisted living. Are we still the matriarch and the patriarch or is the next generation taking on that responsibility? And those are really like kind of life cycle questions. I can support you with that the work is really for each of us individually. At least that's my assessment. What do you think? Yeah, I think I think when it comes to you have a house, you've had a house for a long time. I think if you know if that's even in the back of your mind two, five, ten years, maybe you do have a conversations with, with your kids at some point. You know, we're thinking about this, what it, what is your attachment to this? Have you taken out all your things? You know, <laughs> am I holding am I just storing your things? You know, really I think starting there and then and then once you have a, a gauge on maybe where your kids are and how you feel about that, I think that will help put in line as you start to go through your things. Is this important to me? Is this not important to me? You know, one of the things we, we went to a seminar not too long ago about um, donation centers. So a lot of people, they don't want to get rid of their things. Or this was their grandmother's um, dining room set. You know, things that really matter to you. And, and I don't know why, but right now there are places you can definitely donate to. But a lot of that they're not taking at this oh, point. Brown furniture. Brown the kids furniture. don't you want brown furniture no. anymore. <laughs> right? And so, big mahogany. It's, yeah, so just can't do all it. the stuff we were saving. And I wonder, too, I just, and my kids are kind of young ish they're 24 and 27 but they kind of think like the idea that you're asking them to address what they've left in your house it's like you've asked them to kill a puppy. They're like, what? Like, I don't have the energy for this. And I wonder if it's a generational thing, but it's like they, maybe the world is just so chaotic that they want to hang on to their home. You know, that that's their, that's their touch point. So I, it's a real, I think it's something that everybody struggles with. Absolutely. senior 65 kind of place or or just a smaller house or yeah. condo 
and then later I'm going to have to sell that to move into another place. Am I just going downhill with, with equity? You know, like will, will there be bad resale on on the this other place? Well, that depends on the market. So I mean, if I could read the market, I'd be out in <laughs> Vegas <laughs> right now. <laughs> For the most part, <laughs> I know. for the most part, if you're buying and selling in the same market, so if if the market's high and you're getting a lot for your house, you probably have to pay more for your your new place than you would in a down market. Um, but it's it seems very strong right now. Two realtors fees for a realtors fee for each move for each no, you sale. No, you don't pay a buyer's agent. No, I'm saying you've bought your you downsized oh, right. to your house and you paid the realtor for that house. And then you have and to you've pay paid again. for that move and you've downsized that move and then you're doing it again. Yeah. And um and I don't know if there's a way around it unless you kind of postpone your first move and be a little short on the end of your last move, if that makes sense. If you think you're gonna be in your middle move for a longer period of time, is that more fi usually more financially advantageous? Yeah, I would guess the longer you're gonna stay, the more likely that you would build more equity in the second home. And then quality of life. Quality of life is always the thing. You, you really wanna sit that, because you don't, a lot of us, a lot of people that we see tend to stay home for such a long period of time, but there isn't a quality of life. They're no longer getting out. They're not having meals frequently. All these things that just slip by the wayside. And then when they do make a move, all of a sudden they're flourishing because these are things that they're doing again. You have to ask yourself, you have to ask your spouse, your family, what is the quality of life that I'm choosing? I'm choosing, yes, maybe I'm spending that money from the house to do that, but this is what's important to me now or not. And that's okay either way, but you really need to figure out what for you is important. Do you, do you want to be homebound? Some people are completely fine with that, and that's okay, but it's, it's what you value. Mm -hmm. Percentage are for profit. I know there's some that are not for profit. For in terms of assisted livings, yes. So I'd say the majority of us are for profit. Okay. Um, there's probably a few out there that are not for profits. Um, I don't think there's a ton of those. I think at one point there probably were, but it is it, it's a business and it's an expensive business and it has a lot of overhead. So when people say to me, it's expensive, I say I know. I'm not, I'm not, Sacra, you know, I, I agree with you. It is expensive. I don't make the pricing, but it does. It has a, you know, labor costs are very high. Electricity, it has overhead. So you're definitely going to be paying for those things. Yeah. Stacy, I've been in not-for-profits that are not significantly less expensive than for-profits. No, because you still, it's the same thing. You need to provide the laborers. Yeah. Of anything, is the labor is the most is yeah. expensive, and that's what you're trying to do, and you want consistent, good people. And that's always what the struggle is going to be. And, you know, the, the other thing is when you're looking at that, storms, floods, whatever, we're staffed. Whether our staff can't go home or whether we sleep there and all of a sudden Stacy's bathing you on Friday night, <laughs> it happens. You know, you, that is something that has to happen. Um, we will always be staffed so that our residents can, in any assisted living, I don't need just us, will be staffed so that your loved one is cared for. It has to be. When you go to assisted living, you don't buy like you're buying a condo, do you? Unless you're going to one of these, like a continuing care community, then that would be you're buying into it. So you're paying a big fee up front, okay. and then you can be on the campus-like setting and then move through that. Ours, a lot of assisted livings, no, you're not buying. You're doing a monthly lease. But some of them have a, an entry community fee, correct? Most places have a community fee, and that's in the beginning. It's a one-time fee, and that's really, I liken it to a condo fee. It's going to get all the necessary things done and out of the way before you come in. Uh, one of the other things is that will have the nurse come out, be getting in touch with the doctor. There will be some forms that need to be filled out with the doctor, getting the apartment ready, getting it how you want it. It's the same type of thing. Um, the community fee, and, and because there's so many places out there, the community fee may not have been something that people pushed before, and they may be doing that more now because, you know, if you've got five assisted livings assessing you, they need to know that you're taking that apartment because you've actually taken something offline that somebody else may need. Mm -hmm. So that's something that they may be pretty strict on now. Stacy, uh, in the case where someone comes into an assisted living situation, and at the moment they're financially secure, mm -hmm. but over time maybe their um, ability to move up, but their 
ability keeps declining, but also their uh, financial situation keeps declining. Mm -hmm. So at some point, they can't do anything about where they go and their finances are exhausted. Mm -hmm. What happens? So what we would do is, we're very lucky in our community, we do have a subsidy program. So I've had people have been able to stay there for 13 years because we, we offer the subsidy. Now I don't have a ton, I have 18 slots. So to be very honest with you, in order for that a slot to be filled, somebody has to come off that slot. However they do that, whether they've moved to a nursing home, whether they've moved to California, or, or unfortunately they've passed. That's just the, how the, the system operates. I will tell you that I tell people if you're running out of funds to go with six months private pay simply because you want the choice. You want to have the choice of where you go instead of I get stuck here because this is, this is where I had a bed. I am a firm believer that you should be touring, again, three places, places that you feel comfortable with and go with some money because if you go with some money, you're much more likely to have that choice to choose where you want to be and what you feel comfortable with. And as the um, Sancta Maria just closed, buildings are closing. Mm -hmm. As buildings close, the waiting lists get longer. Um, I consulted the Leland Home, which is a rest home, which is an option we didn't discuss. If anyone's interested, they can talk to me privately. But Somerville Home just closed and Sancta is closing. And as a result, buildings that never were hot are now hot. I called a building that I could always place people in and they now have an eight month wait list. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely something to consider. But going into the nursing home arena with private pay funds is always a plus and will open your options. And I think that you're really good at acknowledging that people have to think about this early. A lot of assisted livings, I always ask people, do you ever look at the money and say, oh, you got four years, oh, this is gonna work for six years? And some assisted livings don't do the math with you. So I just wanna alert people to be aware of that and to be in, in touch with as they're spending down their resources and start balancing um, the money they have, their care needs, and what the marketplace looks like for nursing home placement. And that's really where, when you're in a community, you'll have relationship with, with, with those people who work in the community. So you'll know your executive director. That's kind of, that's your ship leader. You know, that'll be the person that you'll be in contact with. She'll, you know, that she, he will help guide you in that direction so that they can help you. This is what we're gonna do to preserve some of your assets. This is how we're gonna work with this. Um, and, and you'll have a, you'll already have those relationships formed. So you'll have some comfort. You'll know when you're talking to those people, you'll know the nurse who's in on the meeting, people that you see daily, honestly. And, and that will be what helps guide you. And those people will help you. And they have connections. We all have connections, places that we work with, people that we work with on a daily basis that will help put you in touch with those people. So we're, I, we're almost like, like um, what did you just mention? Closing. Somerville Home? No. Sancta Maria. Sancta Maria. Isn't that big? It was a big hospital, so big building. Why is it closing? I think that the standalone nursing homes and the reimbursement oh, rates, it, was it, it's the, was the, it was the nursing home. So it's not, it was never assisted with them? Not to my knowledge. No. Always. No. Always a, nurse, it, always a nursing home, mm -hmm. and these standalone homes that are not necessarily corporate don't really have the resources to borrow from Peter to pay Paul, and I think that we're seeing a lot of that happen. Nursing home is not that profitable because the reimbursement rates are not always high. The Medicare reimbursement is high, but the Mass Health reimbursement is not. And you just, you just hit on a fact. A lot of people will say, are you privately owned? Are you corporately owned? You know, we all have our feelings about corporations however when you are corporately owned you do have some options just like Sari said you can take from the next building to pay for that when you're not your bottom line is your bottom line you either have it or you don't so when you have more options and you have more people supporting you, you have other places that you can go to you have more resources and that would be the benefit to something like that I think a reverse mortgage, a mortgage company pays you monthly, oh. so you're almost taking equity out of your house every but, month. Mm -hmm. What is it when you like, you so, hold the mortgage to like your kids? Sometimes people put it in a trust for their kids, 
So that way, if you had to go to a nursing home or something, they couldn't take you. Are you thinking about kind of designing an income stream while you stay in your own home? No, I was thinking of using the income from them paying me to go someplace else. Oh, when they stay in your home. So you're essentially making, you're selling your home to your kids, and you're essentially holding the mortgage. Yeah. Yeah. So and they pay a monthly fee, and then you can use that monthly fee to where you're going. And I know right. people who've actually I've known done, that. That have done that. Um, when you've done that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're cl closing in on three thirty. I think we can stay after Ellen, um, Carla, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. And you can talk to us individually if you have any questions for us. Sure. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.